All right, this morning we are going to finish our series on the armor of God, which means we're also that close to finishing our study on the book of Ephesians. Um, I think it's been two years we've been in this book. We've been on the study on the armor of God for a couple of weeks. Um, I think the timing is either interesting or divine. Just the things that you are going through, so many stories in our body, I know your circumstances, and just things that are happening in our world, uh, things that are happening in our church, that we would understand the importance of the armor of God and fighting our battles where we're supposed to, amen? Would you say the timing is um, coincidental, or would you say it's divine? Yeah, it's divine. This morning as we begin uh, our message, I want to, because we're finishing our study on the armor of God, I want to go back through, and I'm just going to try to re, uh, recapture all of the different pieces of the army, armor before we finish. And so I'm going to talk about the whole armor of God in 15 or 20 minutes, and then we're going to finish it up. And some of you are thinking, well, why didn't you just do that in the first place? We'd have been <laughs> done a long time ago. But um, I just think it's important for us to camp on stuff and really get the, these things into our system. And so I'm going to go through all these verses. Paul began by uh, introducing the armor. He said, this is Ephesians 6, verses 10 and 11. Uh, remember, he's addressing this church that he started. It's a church that he loved deeply. It's a church that grew to be, um, they say, at least 10,000 people. Um, he is now in prison, and they get this letter uh, via a courier. One of the people that was part of Paul's inner circle brings this letter to them, and it's a message of encouragement. But he's wrapping up the whole letter, uh, beginning in verse 10. He says, finally... Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Everybody say whole. whole. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Some of your translations have the word wiles of the devil. The word in the original language in the Greek is meta huduo or huduno. The word meta is where we get our word methodology the word huduo is where we get our word trickery. It's actually where uh, the same place where Harry Houdini got his last name. He wasn't born Harry Houdini. Uh, he was born something else. Uh, he grew up in New York. He was a descendant of a Jewish family. He started practicing his magic, and he wanted to change his name to something that fit uh, his act, the, the things that he was going to do. And so he got his name from this very same Greek word we're studying today only in this case, it's a reference to the methodology and the trickery of the devil. And we mentioned in that very first sermon on the armor of God, several circumstances that the devil takes advantage of in our life to employ his trickery or his methodology or his schemes or his wiles. I want to mention just a few of them this morning for your uh, uh, reminder. When we are new Christians, he will get out his traps. He will set them. The last thing the devil wants is for a new Christian to continue to walk in that freedom. And so he will try to trip them up. He doesn't want the testimony of a new Christian. You remember when we were new in the Lord, we were so excited and we were telling everybody what had happened and there was this great change in our life. Uh, oh, for those days again, amen. But those were those, that's, what we, that's the things that were part of us, and the devil wants to stop that. There's nothing like the powerful witness of a new believer. And so he has his specific methodology, his specific trickery, his specific wiles, and he tries to stop what God is doing in a new Christian's life. He also mentioned that when we are in the valley, valley of the shadow of death, he has a certain trap, a certain methodology for us in that place. Not our death, but somebody that we love. When somebody that we love dies, Satan will come and he will misrepresent God. He will indict God. He will say, well, how can you believe in a God like that when you have prayed and prayed and prayed? How can you believe in a God like that when they were so faithful, they gave their life to Christian service or whatever it is? He has these traps that he sets for people in those circumstances. And Paul says, we need to put on the whole armor of God so we can stand against those things. 
Another situation that he takes advantage of in our lives is when something good is about to happen to us. The devil is not all-knowing or omniscient. He doesn't know everything, right? But he does have an audience with God. We know that from Job. He can come and go into the throne room. He's eternal. He's been around forever. The Bible says that uh, the devil was the most powerful angel of all of the angels in heaven. He's been around for all of eternity, so he's seen a few things. He can discern, I believe, when God is about to do something good in our lives, and when that's about to happen, he will set a trap for you. He has a methodology to get you sidelined, to get you uh, to a place in your faith where you no longer believe in God. He doesn't want you to enjoy that good thing. We've all been in that place where something really good happens to us in the natural and at the same time something bad happens just in the natural I'm not speaking about spiritual battles yet but something bad happens or something bad is going on in our life in the natural and we can't enjoy the good you understand what I'm saying that happens in a spiritual sense God is about to unleash something good in your life and the devil will come along with this specific trap to derail you in your faith. These guys that go out in the woods and they trap, I don't know, bobcats and cougars and all these animals and they sell their fur to the fur people and they have a specific trap and specific bait for each animal. What works for one would not work for another. And that's how the enemy is. He has a methodology. He has trickery for every situation that we encounter because he wants to try to trip us up. Another example of when we see the trickery of the enemy is as soon as we take a step of obedience out of faith, you decide that you're going to start going to church or you're going to stop doing this or you're going to start doing that. It's a step of obedience. It's a sacrifice. You put your faith on the line and as soon as you do that, you can count on the methodology of the enemy. He wants to trip you up in that situation. Another example of when he does that is when we are in conflict with others, right? You're in a conflict with uh, someone in your family, someone that you work with. Uh, there's harsh words that are said. Listen, listen, conflict is a normal part of life, isn't it? And the enemy uses that to trip us up in our spiritual lives. When we're the victim of injustice, he sets his traps for us. The very definition of injustice is that something has happened to you and you have no control over it and it makes you mad and your flesh rises to the surface and you begin to wonder why God doesn't intervene, why God doesn't strike that person dead, whatever it is. When there's an injustice done to you, your flesh will rise up. It's the enemy trying to trip you up and get you to indict God. We have to put on the whole armor of God so we recognize those times and lastly, in that message, we said that when we are about to die, he has a trap for us. He wants to get us to reject our faith in God in those places. Turn away, not cry out to him. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Remember we said one of the greatest tricks of the devil is to convince people that he doesn't exist. He's happy to work behind the scenes. He's happy to get us to blame the evil of the world on everything else. It's society, right? That's why we're in the mess we're in. It's society. Now it's because of history. It's the critical race theory. It's, it's all of history's fault. Or it's because of the reckless choices of individuals. That's why we're in the mess that we're in. That's why you're in the mess that you're in. No, that's not why we're in the mess that we're in. We're in the mess we're in because the devil is evil and he wants to destroy the world. He's not content just destroying Christians. He wants to destroy everything that was made in the image of God. And if you are alive and you have breath in your lungs, you were made in his image. Even if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, he wants to destroy everything. How many people are caught in a place of bondage, whether it's the bondage of addiction or unforgiveness or greed or deceit or whatever it is? How many people are entrapped by a bondage and they don't even know who their captor is? Could you imagine being a prisoner of war? 
you're in a battle and they've taken you captive and putting you in some kind of internment camp and you don't even know who your enemy is. That's who the devil is. He's quite happy. In fact, he's thrilled when we get to the place where we're blaming everything else, all the evils of the world on everything else except for him. Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, not against society, not against history. We wrestle against all of these spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly places. And so he completes that part by saying, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. That's his introduction to the armor. And then he goes on and he begins to cite specific pieces that we are to put on. Beginning in verse 14a, the first half of verse 14, he says, Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Remember, he had this soldier that Paul was chained to, and he's using that soldier and what that soldier is wearing as an analogy for what we wear in this battle that we're in as Christians. He says, fasten on the belt of truth. Truth is under attack today like never before in our country. The devil is getting Christians to compromise on their faith, to misrepresent what has always been true, what the Bible has always said, water down the gospel. It didn't mean, it doesn't mean today what it meant then. It wasn't written for this day. It was written for that day. You know, all of these different ways that the truth is under attack. That's why the very first part of our armor is to put on the belt of truth. We have to stand in the truth. When the storms are raging around us, we have to have a benchmark. We have to have something that we always go back to. Let God be true and every man a liar, the Bible says. No matter what your teachers say, no matter what society says, no matter what the world says, no matter what some ungodly Bible teachers are saying, the truth of God is always the truth of God. It will never change. It's what you got to put on first. If you go to an, into a battle and you're not walking in truth, you're in trouble. I mean, you won't know up from down, left from right, in from out. You will be mixed up and confused. And isn't that a state of so many people? The truth of God is our anchor. It gives us authority, certainty, gives us clarity. The next piece of our armor, verse 14b, Paul says, and having put on The breastplate of righteousness. Where does the breastplate go? Right here. What does it cover? It covers your vital organs. In antiquity, they thought that your heart was the center of your thinking. They they didn't know that your brain was the center, that your thinking took place up here. They thought it took place in your heart. It's your vital organs. And we wear this thing called righteousness over our entire spiritual vital organs. There's two kinds of righteousness in the Bible. There's the righteousness that we have inherited because of Jesus Christ. The picture of Jesus' righteousness is all throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New. All of the sacrifices, all of the blood sacrifices in the Old Testament are a picture or a type or a symbol of the sacrifice of Jesus. And then we get to the New Testament where Emmanuel came, God in the flesh, and his blood was spilt on the ground below the cross. And the Bible says, because of his sacrifice, you are made righteous if, everybody say if, if. Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Capital L-O-R-D. Doesn't mean you believe in God. Doesn't mean that you believe that Jesus existed. Peter Jennings believed that Jesus existed uh, 20 years ago when he did his report. Time Magazine believed that Jesus existed when they've done numerous pages of articles on him. But if he's your Lord and Savior then he's your righteousness. Is Jesus your Lord today? If Dan Silver was my Lord, that would mean that I would obey everything that Dan told me to do. His wife just rolled her eyes like that would be a terrible thing. I just ratted her out, Dan. It means that he would own me. 
He would be my master. I would have nothing to say about my life because he is my Lord. In antiquity, Caesar was what? Lord. Caesar controlled everything. And if, if Jesus is my Lord, if he owns me, if he controls me, if I'm surrendered to him, if I'm sacrificed to him, then I have a robe of righteousness. If I just believe he existed, I do not have a robe of righteousness. My sins are, make no mistake about it, my sins are not covered if he's not my Lord. It doesn't mean that I'm perfect, but it means when I sin, I repent. I'm not a hypocrite. That's the difference between the two, right? But if he is my Lord, then regardless of what I do, when I appear before the throne room of heaven, he, God, sees me as perfect, like I've never sinned. Have you sinned? Yep. But he sees me as perfect because the robe of righteousness has covered me. That, that covers my heart. It covers my vital organs. It's vital that I have the robe of righteousness, you see. But the other kind of righteousness that's in the Bible from beginning to end is the righteousness that we walk in because of what Jesus has done. Paul said over and over and over and over, therefore, like I'm, uh, you know, yes, you're covered, your sins are forgiven, therefore, walk in righteousness, walk differently. We wrestle against our flesh, we sacrifice our flesh, we crucify our flesh. And as we do that, there's this confidence and this covering and this boldness in my spiritual life. Paul says, put on the belt of truth and then the breastplate of righteousness. Next he says, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The Roman soldiers, you know, had these studded boots, um, like track shoes an athlete would wear, or cork boots that a logger would wear, or studded tires on your car when you're going over the pass. When you have something like that on your car or something like that on your feet, you have this firm footing. You're, you're not, you have this confidence, this boldness. You're not slipping around. And Paul says that the peace of God that we have in our lives gives us firm footing no matter what comes our way. If it's a storm, if it's death, Whatever it is, we have this firm footing knowing that God is with us. First Corinthians 10, 13, through Paul, the Holy Spirit says, I will not give you more than you can bear. How many have hung on to that promise? How many have thought, uh, God, I'm not sure I can bear this. There's a peace that comes with that. How many are carrying an awful lot right now? You don't have to raise your hand, but you're carrying a lot. And you think, oh, the Bible, Jesus said that cast all your cares on me for my way is easy, my burden is light. And there's a, that's, that's true because everything Jesus said is true, but it doesn't mean that it's like there's no weight up there. It means that you can carry the weight that's up there because he is with you. Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said, and lo, I am with you always. Hebrews 13, 5, the writer of Hebrews is quoting Deuteronomy is where God said, I will never leave you or I will, and I will never forsake you. That's the hobnailed boots that we have. That's the traction that we have. It gives us peace no matter what comes our way. Verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. We talked about two kinds of shields in Paul's day. There was a small round one that was attached to their arm, kind of like the Captain America style. And when they were in the battle, they would use that. They would defend, the, defend or uh, go against the spears of the enemy or the arrows that would come their way. There's that kind of shield. And then in antiquity, they had another kind of shield. And this is the kind that Paul was referring to in this passage because it's the word that he chose. Paul knew both words. There was a shield that was described like a door. 
And you would get behind that door. The soldiers, it was a heavy door. It was like a hundred pounds. They would put it in front of them. They would stick it in the ground. And they would get side by side with other soldiers. And they would stand their ground while the fiery darts of the enemy was coming their way. Those fiery darts is a great picture. In antiquity, they had perfected this art of hollowing out arrows And they would put sulfur or pitch in those arrows. And then they would shoot them at the enemy's gates or the enemy's walls or the enemy's fields. And they would cause massive destruction. They couldn't put the fire out. And there are times when we have arrows flying all around us. And we can't use that small shield of faith. We can't advance. We can't stand up. We can't do anything other than link hands with other Christians. A cord of three is not easily broken, Solomon said. We link hands with other people and we get behind our faith and we just hold our ground while the arrows are flying. We've all been there. There's a great Proverbs, Solomon said in Proverbs, I think it's 26, yeah, 26.2. He said, Like a flitting sparrow or like a flying swallow, so a curse without a cause shall not alight or a curse without a cause shall not land. Those of us that live out in the country and the sparrows and the swallows, just they make their nest everywhere and, you know, they're they're just always flighting around and you know, when you were little, you just wanted them to land so you could shoot them with your daisy red rider, you know, just, just settle down so I could shoot you. You're driving me crazy. It's a great picture, you know, of the arrows that are just flying all around us. But Solomon said, a curse without a cause will not land on you. You get behind your shield of faith and you hold your ground. And if there's ever a time where this church is holding their ground and we're behind our shield of faith, it's a time like right now, isn't it? Like those things are not going to land. I don't, I'm not prophesying how something's going to end. I'm just saying my shield of faith is never going to let me down. And the fiery darts of the enemy are never going to start my house of faith on fire. It's never going to happen because God is with me. And even in that is peace. And finally, we get to verse 17. Paul says, and take the helmet of salvation And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. John spoke about this a couple, two or three weeks ago. Just did a great job. The sword is the only offensive weapon in the mix, right? The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, shoes that have firm footing. And then we get to this offensive weapon. We have the much needed protection of all those other things. But if we're in a battle with an adversary that wants to destroy us, we have to do more than just take cover. Hence the sword of the spirit. It's the weapon that gives us the power and the authority to defeat the devil. What was the purpose of a Roman soldier's sword? I think... I think we maybe could gloss over this sometimes. Why did he have a sword? He wanted to kill something. Right? That's what a sword's for. These guys were bloodthirsty warriors. They didn't didn't have these beautiful decorative swords on their side that they would walk around and try to intimidate you. Like, hey, I got my sword. Don't mess with me. I got my concealed weapons carry permit or whatever they call it. A lot of people in first service have that, right? I got my concealed weapon thing. Don't don't mess with me. Like, no. They had a sword because they were going to kill you. Now, Paul turns this description on its head, and he says, we have the sword of the Spirit so we can kill the enemy. Not literally. But I want to cancel his plans and his purposes for my life and for this church and for this nation and for this community and for your sons and your daughters and my children, whatever it is, I want to kill those things. And I can only use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God to do that. He's not intimidated by me. He's not intimidated by anything about me, but the sword of the spirit kills him. Like, oh, don't get that thing out. Yeah, it's coming right now. Get ready. (laughs) When Joshua was about to take the promised land over, the promised land was possessed by Israel's enemies. 
And God's instructions to Joshua were twofold. One, be strong and not afraid or have great courage. And then he said, meditate on the law day and night and it will go well with you. Meditate on the law of the Lord. You're getting ready to go into the promised land, the land of Canaan. It's full of real enemies, real arrows, real flesh and blood. And God said to Joshua, the key to this victory, don't fool yourself. It's not how big your army is. It's not how well trained you are. It's by you meditating on the law of the Lord every day and every night. This, there's something supernatural to the word of God. That's why we must pray the word of God. We must sing the word of God. We must declare the word of God. When we need provision, when we need direction, when we need a healing, when we need something in our lives in a financial area, something supernatural happens when we use the sword of the Spirit. That's a synopsis of the armor of God. And this morning, in the next few minutes that we have, I want to complete this study as we go to verse 18. Would you stand with me one more time? And we're going to read this verse together. And then we're going to pray, and then I'm going to make a few comments. Okay, you ready? Let's read it together. Go. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Father, this is how Paul ended the study on the armor of God. It, it, it culminates in prayer. There's something about us using the sword of the Spirit in prayer that is supernatural. Father, you are calling your church, which means you're calling Christians, people that call you Lord. You're calling us to prayer. Would you help us to understand and to implement this in our lives? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? The word praying there means to get close to God and ask in the Greek. I like that. Get, just get, get close to Him. Find that place where you can block out everything else and then ask Him. If you're a Pentecostal, um, some of you don't even know what that is or means, but you can look it up after church. Um, if you're a Pentecostal, you would define praying in the Spirit as praying in tongues, which is certainly appropriate. There's times that I do that. I, I don't know what else to pray. I just pray in tongues. I do it by faith, the same faith that I have that my sins are forgiven. I pray in tongues, and I believe that that is effective. I have no proof that my sins are forgiven. There's not handwriting on the wall. There's, you know, I, I, I don't have any proof that Jesus forgave my sins, but I take it in faith, right? You take it in faith. And I also pray in tongues in faith at times when I don't know what else to pray. But it means more than just that. Just as God's word is the sword of the spirit, which defeats the devil in a spiritual realm. Understand? We're not fighting against the devil in a natural realm just as we don't fight against flesh and blood, this battle is taking place in a spiritual realm. And just as the sword of the Spirit is activated, or the Bible is activated in a spiritual realm, something about our prayers take place in a spiritual realm. When we pray, when you pray, you have an audience with God. You understand that? It's you and God. He hears you. He understands you. He has your attention. It's you and God. You have an audience with the creator of the world when you pray. Why? Because you're covered with a robe of righteousness. We understand that. You are perfect. You are sinless. Some of you are thinking right now, no, I'm not. You don't know me. Yes, you are. You are sinless, you're perfect, and when you pray, you have an audience with God. That's what it means when we talk about praying in the Spirit. It's in the Spirit realm. Okay? You need something? Oh, okay. We have a hard time getting our minds around the Spirit of God stuff, I think, sometimes. Like, what, what does that mean? Is it like ghosts? 
How many remember the Art Bell show? It was on like at one in the morning or two in the morning. All these whack jobs would call in and they'd seen things and hopefully none of you called in. Um, if you did, you're a whack job. But anyway, uh, <laughs> these guys would call in and um, talk about these paranormal experiences. And, and even in our world today, there's all these spiritual things um, we got a text a couple days ago about the fall equinox. You know, there's, a, there's something about the fall equinox, you know, where there's a, a, a change in the season. Not spiritual, a different kind of spirit. Uh, there's a change in the season and things are dying. As things are dying, uh, stuff is going to be birthed in you. And, you know, you're just thinking, woo doo 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 doo, -doo right? <laughs> it's, it's, is that what we mean by the Spirit of God? No, it's a real thing. The Bible says that God's spirit hovered over the waters at creation. John 1 says that uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with was, the word was with God and the word was God and by him and through him all things were created, which is a reference to Jesus. The word became flesh. So John 1 and Genesis 1 says that the Holy Spirit hovered over creation and that Jesus created, he was, he was part of that creation, and we know God the Father was there. Spirit's a real thing. I want to try to describe how the spirit of somebody can actually change the way that we behave in the natural. I don't mean there's spirits in us. I just mean um, the way that people live, the the integrity they had, the choices they made, the strength they showed in adversity, uh, it has an impact on us. And we say their spirit is still with us. Their spirit's not in you. You understand what I'm saying? But let's say that, you know, you lose your brother and, and there's something about the way he lived his life or your mom or your dad or your best friend. There's something about the way they lived their life. They just had such integrity. They had such joy in their life. They, they just, there was something about the way they lived and you now are impacted by their life. And so you would say, uh, I just sense their spirit. I'm not being weird. I'm not saying their spirit's in you. You're just, you're changed because of how they lived. That's a healthy thing. We've all, we've all experienced that. It's not that they appear to you in your room at night. It's not that you hear their voices. That's not unhealthy. That's not God. But we can be motivated in our finite, limited, obscured human existence. We can be motivated by the way someone else lives. And we would say their spirit, again, not their, but the way they conducted themselves, the way they carry themselves, empowers me to live differently. That's what personal inspiration is all about, right? Now, if somebody who is dead and gone can inspire me to live differently in my finite world, how much more can the infinite, eternal, always with us, never leaving us, never forsaking us, all-knowing, all-powerful God, how much more can His real spirit change and impact the way that we live and the way that we pray. That's what Paul is getting at here. There is a real spirit of God. It's part of the triune Godhead. It's part of the Trinity. And when you pray, his spirit is anointing you and empowering you. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit of God himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. A few verses earlier, Paul is talking about how all of creation is groaning for the redemption of this world. He begins the book of Romans by talking about how broken this world is, 
how messed up it is, how messed up relationships are. And he carries that theme all through the book of Romans and he gets to the eighth chapter and he kind of peels back the curtain a little bit and he reveals something to us that we wouldn't have known otherwise. Listen, he says, all of creation wants this broken world to be healed or fixed. He says that, that creation actually groans as in the pains of childbirth. What a picture. Remember that, ladies? Husbands? There's some things that happen in a delivery room that should never be said anywhere else, right? Like you are sweating and, and not cursing. Well, maybe you were, but sweating and, and you're in agony and you can't, I mean, it's just like, get this thing out of me, you know, just crying out. It's so painful. Have you had times in your life where that's how you prayed? Oh, God, I can't even articulate it. I've got no words. I've run out of words. We were with Sherry and Will and Dell on well, a few times at Friday night and just praying for joy and Dale said, man, I, I just don't have any words. I, I don't even know what to pray. Run out. And in those times, the real, eternal, omniscient Spirit of God intercedes for me and helps me pray. Look, I was, I was brought up in a Pentecostal church my mom would go in the back room and, of our little trailer house and <laughs> she'd pray in tongues like a wild woman and I'd have to get my friends out of the house, you know. They thought something bad was happening. <laughs> i open the door. If she's doing it, <laughs> oh, we can't go in there. But... <laughs> and I'm not, Lord, you know my heart, I'm not making fun of that at all. It's, it's certainly appropriate, but there's so much more to pray in the Spirit the Spirit of God just comes on you and you just say, God, I don't know what to pray. But I know that your real eternal omniscient Spirit's going to make something happen. That's praying in the Spirit. Four ways we pray, Paul says. We pray at all times with all perseverance. I look at my list. I should know this, shouldn't I? We pray at all times for all needs, with all perseverance for all saints. I think if we substituted the word some there for all, it reflects the way that we pray too often. We pray sometimes for some needs with some focus or tenacity or perseverance and for some saints. We're talking to Sherry the other day and if you don't know the Townsends, um, McConnells, Browns, their father and mom were just, they were evangelists and uh, Sherry was talking to her dad the other day and her dad was talking about how when they first started their ministry, they just prayed for everything, all things. They prayed for their gas tank because it was empty. They prayed for their refrigerator because it was empty. They prayed over their paycheck because it wasn't enough to go the distance. They prayed for everything. I wonder how much we forfeit in the kingdom of heaven because we don't pray for all things with all perseverance. I was thinking maybe we'll have a list and it's like 600 people that go to church here when they're not sick. <laughs> we just pass that list around and you could each pray for one, two people every day. We could get through the list. And every year we'd pray for everybody in the house. Could you imagine the unity and the relationships that would build? Pray all the time for all needs with all tenacity and for all saints.
finally, how do we activate this praying at all times in the Spirit? Two things, real simply. First, we must understand that the gift of prayer is activated by the habit of prayer. Okay? The gift of prayer is activated by the habit of prayer, and then the gift is realized in our life. Have you ever got a gift that requires a habit before the gift can mean what it's supposed to mean? You ever got a treadmill? I don't recommend giving that to somebody as a gift. <laughs> hey, honey, <laughs> but you could buy it for yourself. A treadmill without the habit is of no use. But when you develop the habit that's part of getting a treadmill, it becomes a great blessing, doesn't it? Like your cardio and your heart, every, every, all your body benefits. How many have pianos in their living rooms? Beautiful pianos. You walk into somebody's living room and you say, oh, I don't know. I didn't know you knew how to play the piano. And they say, I don't. <laughs> I want to know how. I saw something on America's Got Talent and it inspired me to buy a piano, but there was no habit attached to the gift. And so the blessing was never realized. Remember those recorders that you had in grade school? And all that we learned how to play was three blind mice, three blind mice. Does it take a habit to play three blind mice? Nope. But if you develop the habit of music, you could whip out a saxophone and play Mozart. God wants to make a symphony out of your prayers. It's a gift that requires a habit, and then it becomes a greater gift. The second part of how we implement or activate the gift of prayer in our life is we have to condemn condemnation. Right? We have to condemn the thought of condemnation. The devil wants to tell you, you have no business praying. I know who you are. I know what you've done. God's not going to listen to you. That is a lie because you are covered with the robe of righteousness. Understand that. This last week I was praying with one of the men at our church, and he shared this story with me that I've never heard anybody share before. He said, when I became a new Christian, I developed the habit of prayer, and I saw supernatural, miraculous things happen. And while I was praying, I was still wrestling with a strong addiction to alcohol. Now think about that. I have a, another friend who... When he became a Christian, he would smoke marijuana and read the Bible. And eventually the Holy Spirit, not a pastor, the Holy Spirit said, you shouldn't be doing that. That's the robe of righteousness and then walking in righteousness. It's a great example of that. But my friend had developed a habit of prayer because he had the robe of righteousness. Isn't that powerful? Don't let the devil tell you that you can't pray because it's a lie. When the devil tells you that you can't pray because of who you are, you say it's exactly who I am that allows me to pray because I am a son or daughter of God Most High. That's our armor. Often when pastors or teachers teach on this, they or you can see pictures of the armor of God and Bible bookstores, they don't exist anymore, but they used to have them. And they have all the armor on those things, and they stop at the sword of the Spirit. But Paul didn't stop there. The original language, it's not a period after the sword of the Spirit. It's a comma. And now some of our best translations continue the sentence on praying in the Spirit at all times. That's how you activate this stuff. There's power in your prayers. You're not weak. God's listening to you. His presence is with you. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you that you're calling us to deeper things. In this season that we are in, that we are walking through the last 24 months or so, there's been an incredible thing that has happened. You have gotten rid of the dross or are getting rid of it. You're getting rid of the chaff, and you're putting in us something that's
precious, eternal. You're calling us to pray. There's nothing else that we do in this Christian life that's greater than that. It's where we fight our battles, praise and prayer. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to implement this stuff in our lives, that we would be a church of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.